on my Hawaiian shirt, my fancy Hawaiian straw hat, and I'm barefoot. So away we go. Hey. Uh, as many of you know, this is called a program called Let Me Introduce You. 5.30 every Tuesday, we try to bring to you some interesting and unique people that here live here in the Valley. And uh, this afternoon, I'm very excited and proud to welcome Dr. Mary Suzuki, who is the superintendent of the Bear Valley Unified School District. How this works, if you haven't been with us before, Mary and I are going to talk for maybe 20 minutes or so, and then we'll open this up and you'll be welcome to ask some questions of her. Roughly, we're going to have Mary kind of go through her life career path, if you will. She's going to talk a little bit about how some things we know fairly sure about the end of this school year, and then do some speculation about next school year. I think you all understand there are so many unknowns in this kind of crazy life we're living right now that any definitive answers, even about the ending of this school year, let alone what next year might look like, are really just the very best educated guesses we would have at this point because no one really knows. And that if any of you think you know, you probably don't. So Mary, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Uh, let's go back a few years, Mary, and kind of tell us a little bit about where you were raised, a little bit about your mother and father. Are you an only child? Can we <laughs> kind of start there? Okay, well, um, first off, thank you for having me. It's really nice to be here. Tori, Phil, and I know Beth has been a big part of this, so thank you so much. This is great. Um, I actually grew up in the Midwest. I am one of five. My husband, who's a psychiatrist, says that the dysfunction increases after three children. So since I'm the fifth, there is quite a bit there, I guess. However, um, I grew up in the Midwest in Illinois and Rockford, Illinois, which at the time that I grew up was the second largest city. However, now it has dropped down to the fourth largest city. And growing up there, uh, it actually really solidified my understanding of how important education is. I grew up in a high school that still at this point uh, is 65% of the students graduate from high school. So the dropout rate is 35% in that high school. I also, um, at the time that I was growing up, they cut out all sports my junior year and senior year because there was a tax referendum that didn't pass. So that also impacted the community significantly. And the third thing um, that really impacted that time growing up was the unemployment rate was over 25%. So Rockford at that point, although I, I thought I had a great childhood, I thought it was a wonderful place to grow up uh, because I had incredible teachers and I had people who really believed in me and encouraged me to go on to college. And uh, I was able to get a scholarship for Northwestern University. And so I went to Northwestern University and was a biology and science major. At that point, I was really young and I was still only as tall as I am now. So I looked about 12 and hey, and uh, I was 16 when I went away to college. So I was really immature and um, probably a little scary. So at that point, I, I finished my uh, years at Northwestern and went to become a physical therapist. So I became a physical therapist and worked at Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. I worked at the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago. And in my fifth year, fourth or fifth year being a physical therapist, oh, the really important thing though, this was probably life changing, right? Is that I met the love of my life. So you'll see pictures of him soon. Um, Dan Suzuki, who is just an amazing human being, okay? He's also a psychiatrist, which is a good thing uh, when you're, you know, Fixing you, you mean? Is that why it's well, a good thing? Me, that's a very good thing. And Mary, how did you get from the Midwest to California? Well, Dan had actually gone to college out here at Stanford. So originally we were going to move to Northern California. So he was in medical school. I was in physical therapy school when we met. And um, when he finished his residency school and I was working as a physical therapist, uh, you know, I called out here for jobs and we ended up in Southern California because he did his residency at UCLA. And we fell in love with California. You know, California is such a mix of so many types of people. And coming from Rockford, Illinois, which was very provincial, it was a whole different world to come out here. And so we both fell in love with it. Then we, we've been married 38 years this September. So we have, and then we started having our kids, right? So we have three beautiful children who are now adults. But once we came out here, um, he finished his residency. I was a physical therapist. I started at USC for a doctorate, um, really looking at how children with challenges 
um, motoric challenges, how it impacted their learning. And during that time, I fell in love with the classroom. I went into some classrooms to you know, work with students and to meet with teachers. And I thought, wow, this is life changing. This is in a classroom, a teacher has the greatest control um, of helping students to learn and grow and creating a society. So they have that impact on a child that is like creating, it's very much like a family. It's like creating your own society as a group. And so going into that classroom, I thought, second to the parent, I felt a teacher, the, the impact that the teacher had on a child's life was, uh, it just was really amazing to me. And so from that, I thought I should get my teaching credential and then um, see what, what I really wanna do. One of the big things about me is that I do believe that we grow in each position we're at and what we learn, the knowledge that we gain in any of those positions, really helps mold us to the next because I don't think any of us, maybe a few, okay, probably my husband, really know what you want to do at 17 years of age. And so when we ask students that, a lot of times I think that they look at us like, whoa, that's such a huge question. So becoming a physical therapist, but then keeping my licensure um, valid for a number of years, just five years ago, I finally let it go. Um, but I worked as a physical therapist on the weekends finished the teaching credential, and then once I went into the classroom, I knew that that's what I would do full-time forever. From there, did I had never- work, Did you work in an elementary or middle school or high school? Well, you know, I was a science major, so I worked in an elementary, I got an elementary credential, but also at that time they needed people to teach science. And so even though I didn't have to get the science credential, um, I could teach biology because they, it, they were in high need. So I taught at the continuation high school as well as the, um, elementary school. Elementary was my largest time, K-8, but then I was at middle school and high school for brief periods as well, just you know, three or four years total in the 8-12 area. But I did love that age. There wasn't, you know, people have their favorite grades, but I, the high school and the middle school, that's such an, a time where the students become so aware and reflective of who they are and trying to figure out where they're going. And I think it really helps us as adults when we're teaching and we're watching them struggle through those kinds of, of decisions, it helps us to really reflect on where we are in our own lives as well and what, what really is important about education. So from that, I never thought I'd be a principal. I thought principal was kind of like the sacrificial lamb and I thought that wasn't something I wanted at all. But um, someone asked me if I would fill in for a principal for about six or eight weeks. And during that time, I thought, you know, that it was pretty amazing because all the resources that we needed for students, I found that you had some level of um, ability to be able to get those for teachers and for students and working with teachers and really having those di that dialogue and discussion, I felt so, um, I guess, excited about having those conversations that then I did finish that credential. And then from there, um, assistant superintendent, for a number of years and then became superintendent in Bear Valley. So let's talk about, uh, so you taught, really have teaching experience at all grade levels, at least to some extent. Absolutely. And then went over to the dark side and became an interim principal. And then became- and then decided you'd move on up through the ranks. Let's, let's talk a little bit about why Big Bear. What was the attraction for you and um, why did you come to Big Bear? Why did you apply to be the superintendent here? Big Bear reminds me a lot of the Midwest. Um, Big Bear, the people here are very much a sense of community. And once I came to Big Bear, I have loved every year here, this is my fifth year, because the people from the day that I came for my interview, there was a really nice man who worked at Walgreens who said, hey, do you need help putting your chains on? But I really didn't because I'd put them on in the Midwest too. So I, but he was so kind, everybody up here, it's a whole different type of person that lives in Big Bear. People in Big Bear, they're not pretentious. Um, they're exactly who they say they are. The community here is unbelievable. And I didn't know, when I applied, I had no idea how fortunate I really was and the community that I was gonna become a part of because of working in many different districts, or at least four, this community is such a close-knit group and values our students and also our, our teachers, our principals, our classified staff, the cabinet, our board. Everybody in Big Bear just wraps themselves around 
our students to make sure our kids are successful. So coming up to Big Bear, you know, I've been in Big Bear multiple times, just, you know, on different occasions, but I hadn't really known Big Bear the way that I know Big Bear now. And so I feel beyond just really fortunate that I've been able to be here. I didn't, you know, I thought about being a superintendent, but my, my dream job was actually being an assistant superintendent of curriculum instruction, because I felt that working with the teachers and with um, principals on that, what's going on in the classroom was really where the, um, where, th where things made an impact, because what we're able to offer our students is what really does make the impact. Um, however, I did find that working with such an incredible group and we're so small that I really enjoy working with our teachers, working with our entire staff, and our associations up here are amazing. So Big Bear, I think I became incredibly fortunate, but I was looking for um, something that was smaller so that I think that in a smaller district, we can get a lot accomplished. And one teacher that I was talking to, who's a, a third grade teacher over at Big Bear Elementary, she said to me, you know, Mary, I'm so proud of our district because I, I talk to my friends in other districts and with the distance learning, I feel like we really moved quickly to get things ready for our kids and that we're doing a great job. And she said, you know, I have friends in other districts and because they're bigger, it took a lot longer to make things happen for students. And so watching our teachers too and our classified staff who's out there passing out meals, everyone, after the first six months, I thought, I said to my husband, I am the luckiest human being in the entire world to be in Big Bear because when my friends talk about, I have a lot of friends who are superintendents, right? And we hear other districts and they'll say, hey, are you thinking about this one or that one? And I think, you know what? There really is no place like Big Bear because we know each other, we work together, and we put kids first. Mary, I'm assuming we had some perceptions of Bear Valley and Bear Valley Unified Anything surprise you as you settled in up here? All right, so this is um, this is a little warped, okay? So a little warped. A little warped, okay. <laughs> Those of you who know me know that warped can happen with me. Um, but I did know that I had heard that the previous superintendent he had gone down to a district that I had been in for years, Benita Unified, which was a great district, and I had heard that he was a triathlete and you know really buff and did all these amazing things. He did, um, you know. <sighs> ran all the time, it was just really strong and active. And so I thought, oh, I hope they're not looking for a triathlete because I'm not a triathlete. And so that was one of my biggest concerns was, um, you know, I love the pebble path, I love the trails, but I am not a triathlete and I just learned to ski two years ago. So um, that was one of my misconceptions about Big Bear because Big Bear has been totally, just embraced me wholeheartedly. Um, so. You know, I think that the conception that Big Bear is um, stunningly beautiful geographically, I think that was true and it has been true. I think that I didn't realize that we do have a significant amount of poverty in our district, that 73, 72% of our students are on free and reduced lunch. I don't think that I realized, I mean, I did when I looked at all of our data when, before I came up here, but um, the school district that I grew up in the Midwest with only 60 5% of the students graduating from high school and having a high level of poverty um, with unemployment at 25%. I watched my teachers believed in me. They never, um, they never judged me or thought that I couldn't achieve. They always said, whoa, you can do this. You are, you know, they, they really built us up as students that we could do it, that even if we didn't have funds to go to college, that we could get scholarships, that other things were out there. Um, so I look at Big Bear and I think that some of the students have some struggles that I had as a, as a child and with are there gonna be really opportunities out there? And I know the struggle that some of them go through because I did grow up in a family of five um, in a time where economics were really poor. And I'm sure many of our families right now are struggling with that and trying to figure out how they're gonna pay for meals, um, how they're gonna, are their jobs gonna be there when they come back? So I, I think that I might not have realized how much our kids went through um, until I was really here. You know, it's interesting, and I see that in quality in you and your work, but people have told me that when you made up your mind that you wanted to be the superintendent of Bear Valley Unified School District, very aggressively, you went after this job. 
and we won't talk about all the details of that, but you had made up your mind. This is where you wanted to be, and by golly, you were very aggressive in going after it. And I, I think that's a good quality in that. Thank you. Well, and then the community. I had no idea the sense of community that surrounded our children. Up here, that is the biggest gift that I found when I came here, is that everybody here does know each other, and that people want good things for our students. And I have to say, because I see Ron Peavy with his hat there, Ron Peavy was one of the biggest gifts to me coming up here because he truly supported me and he could answer all my questions and, and help me better understand some of the history of things so that I wasn't totally blind. And he actually gave you the right answers? You should see what he said, Phil. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tell us about your family. You, you have how many children? I have three children, and if you want to put that next slide on um, of my family, I can we can show that. So, okay. okay, so up in the one corner is my beautiful youngest granddaughter, and she is just nine months. Um, in the the second one that is holding my oldest granddaughter, Emily, um, and my husband is in that picture. He looks like he could be the dad because he's such a good looking guy, huh? Mm -hmm. And so he is holding Emily. And then next to that is Emily, is Emily and Charlotte, and they're little sisters, and they're loving, they love each other. It's fun to watch them during this whole isolation time. And then Dan is over, I don't know if it's on the right of your screen, but he is, he is my everything. And he was, he was great, he has been great about, um, he loves Big Bear too. And so if he, whenever he's up here, you'll see him in his Big Bear high school hat, he's pretty funny. And then right below Dan is my, um, youngest son, Matthew, and then right in the middle is everybody. Um, you'll see Dan, and then my, my granddaughters, myself, and then my son, and my son-in-law, and my incredible daughter in love. And then, of course, I couldn't leave out my Ricky, who's right there next to me giving me the kiss um, at the bottom of the screen, because Ricky loves the snow. He actually has dreadlocks in the winter, too. So um, that's basically my family, and they just make me realize that what I do every single day is so important because people are making those same decisions in my granddaughter's schools and I want our schools and, and all schools to be the type of schools where our kids come and they feel safe and they feel nurtured and they feel um, challenged and that our, I know that our, our actually our vision is that our students graduate educated and inspired and prepared to pursue their dreams and we don't even know what those dreams are going to be yet but I know that um, I hope that for our students and I know that we're working very diligently to make that happen. And I want the same thing for my grandchildren. Cool. So Mary, you're up here and Dan is down there during the week. Is that, is that how, what your life looks like? Many people say it's the perfect marriage. And um, you know what, Dan is, Dan is loved by the um, medical field. He's the uh, chief of staff at one of the hospitals and he is a psychiatrist who really is just a tender kind soul and I look at Dan from the time we were young we were always um, people who worked long hours together and we loved it that's both of us feel that what we do is our our passion and our calling and I hope that everybody who I, I just feel really fortunate that I am able to have that passion and calling and that I get to work with the amazing people that I do. Dan, literally, he makes me, he goes, he gets up early, right? Six or six-ish, and he's out the door, starts seeing patients at seven, and Dan probably works till seven or eight at night, and then comes home and sits with his laptop answering different things till nine or 10. So during a regular week, our, our loving relationship was click, click, click on the computers, and then how, what time are you going to sleep? What time are you going to sleep? Crash. So Monday through Friday, that was our loving relationship. And then the weekends, we would play hard together. So it actually worked out really well for both of us because I have a lot of night functions I love to go to. And Dan, um, I love what he does for people. He's just real people. He's one of the best. And so I, I totally understand that that's what makes Dan, Dan. And so it works perfectly for us. Cool. I'd never lived alone since we got married when I was 20, right? So I said, wow, this is a whole new experience. <laughs> Very interesting. Mary, let's, let's reflect back a little bit prior to this virus thing. If you were to characterize your leadership style as a superintendent, would you talk a little bit about that prior to this craziness we're living in now? Um, actually, my leadership style is believing that we empower those around us. 
I, I believe that as a superintendent, my job is to mobilize the resources of our community, of the genius in our own schools with our teachers and our classified staff and our principals, and to make sure that I'm providing everything that people need in order to mobilize that. I don't know, I don't have all the answers. And I think that when I watch people come together to have those conversations, they bring such a gift to that. So part of it would be um, making sure that I'm mobilizing, but not overpowering. The one thing that I would never want to do is micromanage. I believe that we need to have a vision on where we're going. And I think that our vision and mission for the district are very clear about what we want to create for our students. But I think that if I were to tell everybody how we're supposed to do it, we do this step, then we do this step, then we do this step, we would lose the gifts of so many of our really talented teachers, administrators, classified staff. And we need that. I need to make sure that I have the lens of everybody, not just my lens. One of the biggest things, and you know, I do like to talk. I know I do. But one of the biggest things I've learned as a superintendent is you need to listen. You just need to be quiet and listen because people are going to tell you, um, they'll tell you the truth if they really believe you want to hear it. If they really believe that um, you already have an agenda and you know which way you're going, I think that it, it immobilizes people and makes them feel weak. And we have a staff that is so strong. And when you watch how people jumped on board with the distance learning, and I watched our principals. I mean, I see Tina Fulmer over there. I see Catherine. I see Christine. I see um, Manny's there. I mean, we just, I watched what they did. We talked about it in leadership meeting. And the next day, working with their teachers, they were on it, making it happen. And if I had said, okay, we're going to do step one, two, and three, they know the staff the best. The staff knows the students the best. And we all know our community together. So leadership style would be sometimes getting out of my own way, um, but absolutely servant leadership, that I believe that we serve those that we're working with and that our goal as the district is to make sure our staff, our students, our families have everything that they need in order to serve our students so that our students get everything. Great. Let's talk a little bit, uh, Mary, about what what you see happening as we end this school year. What do we know for sure about eighth grade orientation, about what's gonna happen at the high school? Can you talk a little bit about what your best guess is, is how this school year will end? Absolutely, and I think I also saw, um, I, I think that Shelly, I also think I saw Shelly Bassam a little bit ago. Um, one, a couple of different things. I don't know if, if you watch the governor's update every um, day at noon, but I, if I don't watch it, I check in later to watch it on YouTube. Uh, every day, um, we do hear a little bit different. One of the things that we've been consistently hearing over the last few days, and today he shared about stage one, two, three, and four, and he talked about entering stage two being where um, some of the restrictions will be lifted in a few weeks, but that will probably stay there for several months, right? He also talked about um, maybe moving the school year up earlier in the summer, which did surprise me because I was thinking maybe we'd still be more on a restriction and having to start the school year with distance learning since we start in August. Um, but in a district like ours where August 1st is when we start, some of those that start in September, maybe they could move it. But I think that what I did see on all the comments after he spoke, um, <laughs> people had a lot to say. And one of the things that I, Tony Thurmond actually put out a public statement right after the governor spoke, because uh, basically saying, whoa, you know, I know this is um, an interesting concept. However, we know that there's a lot of logistics that would have to take place. So we have been though, working together as a management team and then um, with our associations as well. What we do know is that if we have to um, start the school year, not in brick and mortar, if, we, if that is not an option to go brick and mortar, um, we will make sure that we still have all of the uh, materials our students need and we'll be working with our teachers closely to see is there anything else that they need to be making it work. I think that the difficulty right now is that some students know that it's a hold harmless state. So, you know, they know that the grade may, will be the same as third quarter or higher, but the participation is still important for the ongoing learning. Um, I think that that's a difficult concept sometimes for people because they, they believe, oh, well, then I really don't need to do anything. Um, when I talk to the different principals about what our participation at the elementary is, elementary 
Um, people are really still hanging in there. We're getting high participation rates. Um, high school was super high at the beginning until we had the hold harmless um, grading. And then I think people thought, wow, we're pretty tired, especially if I'm a senior. And so I, my, my worry is my freshmen, sophomores, and juniors for some of those kids who are in those classes that really require that knowledge for the next quarter or the next year. Um, middle school, they're, I know that they're really working diligently too for the participation rate. Um, but in the fall, there will be no hold harmless regardless. If we start distance learning, um, we will meet with families if we can with social distancing. Our back to school nights may look very different. We may have smaller groups um, of you know, 10 to 15 families at a time, socially distanced, meeting with the teacher to go over how you use Google Classroom, how we'll be communicating. If, it's, if we stay with distance learning, we'll really need to get input from our teachers about what is that beginning of the year going to look like. Our teachers in one day, we found out LA Unified closed and San Diego closed. It would have been great if we had had just a week to know that, if they'd given us a little heads up. But we found out and then two days later we were closed. And I, our teachers have been innovative and just jumped on everything. So one of the things we'll be really debriefing with our teachers um, and our classified staff about what really, what else do you need from us to support you? And then also with parent advisories, we've already started some of those. What is it that you need from us as a parent to really support you? If, as the governor states, that we will probably be able to be in school only with a, and a, like you said at the beginning, Phil, this is all so unknown. But if we are able to be in school, um, management team looked at both AB schedules with uh, every other day for students. If we tried to do a morning and an afternoon, logistically, we couldn't do that with our bus and our transportation. So, and we don't, it's really difficult. If you know any wonderful bus drivers, please let us know. We're always looking for great bus drivers. So please, we, they're like such a treasure to us. Um, but that would be difficult to transport. And we have about 36% of our students who do take the bus. So we need to make sure our kids are able to get to school. The other thing, some of the parents said that would be really difficult for them because they'd get to work, they'd have to come back. And then also for our maintenance and custodial staff, just re-sanitizing the schools quickly enough for the next group to come in. The priority for us is safety, student safety. And so whether it looks like a Monday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Thursday, and then Friday would be for just small groups that needed the additional support, and the teacher would screencast their lessons so that the students who are at home are getting those lessons as well. Um, that may be one option. There is no perfect option for parents, and my heart just aches for those parents who need to go back to work and school is where their children are during the day. Um, I know we're also contacting our local daycares around us and asking them if we had this schedule or this schedule, how would that impact you? And so that that, that way we can try and work closely with the community. But that's probably the most reasonable if we do not get to go back full time. If we get to go back full time and they say if we can social distance students, we're hearing that they may hold off on sports, they may hold off on assemblies and large gatherings. Um, but everything is changing day by day. I know the president had a meeting with the governors kind of stating, hey, we need to get schools open a little bit quicker because um, people are going back to work and want to go back to work. So I know that there's a tremendous amount of pressure to open schools, but we won't be able to do that until we really believe it's safe for our employees and for our, our students especially um, so that we do it in a safe, organized way. But we are working on that. I have the most amazing cabinet and our board um, and they are, we're working on online registration already uh, Lucinda Newton is working on that really closely with Mike Chatham and the entire team with our principals as well so that parents can get registered and enrolled for kinder and for the other grades and move our students forward um, on online instead of having to worry last minute about coming in with packets. But that's my best bet is that we will either, and, and I hope I'm wrong, I do hope I'm wrong, is that we will either start distance learning for maybe the first three to four weeks, and then we may be able to go back, hopefully full time, or we will be able to start with a modified schedule those first three or four weeks. But now that I'm hearing that um, they would like us to do summer school and start early, like the schools that are in September, they'd like them to start in August. 
I, maybe they're going to release more restrictions, but I think it all depends on the COVID-19 curve and what happens, right? So. Well, I think you all understand that our school board and Mary may have some vision for what they would like to do, but to some extent, they don't have total control over that because it's driven by the state, to some extent the county, some, to some extent by the national. So it isn't like Mary can just, and the board can say, well, we're gonna do this because it's best for our community. It just doesn't work that way. Well, we've been at it a little over half an hour. I have a hunch that some of you out there may have some questions. There are two ways we can do this. Number one, you would be more than welcome to submit a question on chat, and I assume you know how to do that. Or if you would wave at Tori, she would unmute you, and Mary would be happy to do her very best to answer your questions. So ready or not, I see Liz Harris waving her hand. Tori, can you unmute Liz and see what she's up to? Hi, Mary. Hi. Uh, it's really wonderful to have you with us, and I can't tell you how pleased I am that you've decided to be with us five years oh, and you. hopefully a whole long more thank you. Um, because we just desperate, desperately needed that stability that you've been able to provide the wonderly, wonderful leadership. Right now I've got my Ed Trust hat on okay. and um, it just doesn't seem to me that it's going to be very logical that we're going to be able to take students in a bus anywhere. <laughs> frankly. Um, and so I'm sure, and I think it's way premature for us to have a conversation because you don't even know what next year's year is going to look like yet. But I know that Ed Trust is very interested in supporting um, particularly Big Bear Elementary, but depending on how things would go and what the needs are, it might be a bigger uh, opportunity than that. So um, I'm hoping that you'll keep us in mind as you think about the needs and the possibilities. If there are, for instance, if we are doing distance learning and if there are manipulatives, as an example, that our children need that would assist them in learning fractions, learning anything, um, I'm hopeful that you would think of us as maybe a resource for um, manipulatives or other kinds of material that would just give them that extra little bit that the Big Bear Elementary uh, School has really benefited from from us. Absolutely. And so um, I, I don't, I'm not expecting you to have an answer at this point. I just want to make sure that you keep us in mind. Thank you, Liz. I know that in one of the other slides we have too, um, there are students at the lake from Big Bear Elementary that were with Bear Tech because there's two other slides that have tons of pictures. We'll flash those up at the end so you can see them, but they basically show you know, Bear Tech, how hugely they support us, the fire department, um, the real world program, you know, all of the different groups that come in and really surround us. And so we are so appreciative for Bear Tech. Thank you, Liz. I know that our principal, um, I think that I see Christina here too, and I know that she is, will absolutely look into that too for what they need, but thank you. I Eric. saw that Heidi either had a question via chat. Heidi, are you there? Mary, this is Heidi. Hi, hey, you know, you were so funny in yours, Mike. You were hilarious. I liked it. This is Heidi. Oh, gosh, your voice has changed. <laughs> Well, thank you, Mary. Uh, I was just thinking about the uh, sort of the residual effects that this uh, episode in our history will have on our society. And also, I just wondered if you thought about once things go back to what we're used to or some semblance of that, what do you think the residual effects of this will be on education in terms of maybe more students being online or, or maybe more students appreciating the teachers that they have you know, in front of them? Uh, have you thought about what those residual effects might be? You know, I think that um, for our teachers, I watch how they came alongside of each other to really shore up what we needed to be able to do distance learning. And I watched how quickly our teachers gained that, um, that level of expertise and skill in Google Classroom, Zoom meetings, um, a lot of the great resources that are out there. So one of the residual effects is, I think it caused us to have to move forward with some innovation um, and I think that 
our staff was incredible with doing that. So I think that we might see more flipped classrooms where students um, receive a lesson and then they're able to do a part of that and come back and have the discussion in the class. I believe that parents um, adore their teachers at this point. I heard someone say that they were gonna go outside and take off their student of the month sticker for their child <laughs> because they were the teacher now and they totally understood. So I think that, I think that there's a real respect for our teachers. Um, I see that from a lot of parents. I've heard so many kudos to our teachers and I think that that's a big part because our teachers didn't shy back but our teachers really moved forward with the innovation to make sure students had not just a, you know kind of a lower level of learning but they really made sure that they were giving students things that were of value to learn. The other piece that I watched during all of this is the residual effect is going to be how did we as adults model it? Um, were we, our students are resilient, but I think that when they see us under times of major stress, like the pandemic, they're watching us really closely. They're watching how do we interact with each other? How are we, um, you know, with our, in our families, how are our families interacting? So I think a big part when they come back, depending on what experience they've had, I mean, there's so much out there with families that my heart aches for a lot of our families and what I know they're going through. Um, but I do believe that there'll be discussion about, you know, tell us about, you know, asking the students to share some of their experiences. Um, one parent said that it would be great, and the Zoom meetings I think help our kids, but one parent said it'd be great if they did like a recess on Zoom, if somebody just opened up a 15 minute recess where the kids could just talk about everything and share because the kids live for those moments where they see their teacher and each other. So I think that the good things are the innovation that has come out of it. Um, I think the other thing that has come out is we've been able to see what is our digital divide in our community. And then Tina, who is like, you know, a very humble person who doesn't ask for a lot. I'm really impressed that during this, when the um, county asked what we needed, Tina requested 600 Chromebooks. I mean, that was impressive, Tina. And so um, I also, I think that what will come out is how important our constant tech refresh is because we see how it's been used. I wonder if some parents might really like distance learning, um, and we might see more hybrid students. I think that it'll have one of two effects, some that are so excited to come back, and then others that think the hybrid program might really work for their child because their child is able to focus a little bit more in that environment. So I think it just depends on the child. I think it depends on the family. But I think that we are going to have to look for um, what are those learning gaps that are going to occur when, we're, um, when kids come back. And also, that level of stress, you know, what is the residual kind of for our students and our families? Because some of our families will be coming back without jobs and be going through a lot in the family too. So I think those are some. Are there any chat questions out there that you've seen? Yes. So we have one from Beth and she asks, great to see some community activities to support the class of 2020. Can you share any plans for the district, any plans the district has to celebrate these seniors? Wonderful, that's a wonderful question, Beth. Um, one of the things, and today, just today, I, first off, I need to just give huge thank yous to ASB and to the PSA. I know you probably see the signs, the senior signs around, the, around your neighborhoods, and PSA and ASB um, purchased those for our students and are putting them in our seniors' yards. We also, today, one of our teachers, who's a senior coach um, for softball, she actually took flowers to all of her students because this would have been their final senior game. So. I know that the high school is doing many different meaningful things for, for the students. The district, we're looking um, at a virtual graduation for the last day, the graduation day, which is I think the 12th or the 14th. Um, I think maybe the, I don't know if anybody knows it, go like this, Mary. <laughs> it is the 12th, okay, thank you. Um, on the 12th, and one of the things, our students did a survey, and the one thing our students want more than anything is a physical graduation, to throw their hats in the air, to be able to hug each other, to just celebrate the 13 years of all the hard work that they've done, and we know that they're probably mourning the most. One of the things that we've looked at is we've put our graduation date as late as the end of July. Um, we put two dates at the end of June, just in case, and we put one all the way at the end of July. Um, so hoping that if these restrictions do lift, we saw the Air Force Academy had a graduation. Um, they didn't have anybody at it, but they had over a thousand graduates. Um, could we put 164 or 65, you know, six feet apart, have them walk on, walk off? Um, 
and then have the parents sit in groups of two or four so that they're six feet apart based upon their nuclear unit. We're looking at some of those things, but until the public health department tells us it's safe, we know that that is the most important thing to our high school students, that and prom. Prom, um, this, the junior class is working on prom, and I know that they've already worked out that when the graduation can occur, um, prom, they will do possibly that Saturday after, and that the, it'll be done at the high school, all the decorations and everything, um, that we have a great person who could do all the decorations and make it something really special. So all of those conversations are going on constantly for our students about what can we do to make it meaningful. We'll be getting signs to put at all of our schools as well. Um, but the virtual, there's multiple thoughts. Um, you know, the majority, when I talked to the high school staff meeting, a lot of them and a lot of parents felt they would like a virtual at least to have some closure to the end of the year. Um, but then some people are, no, we don't want a virtual because if we do virtual, it's going to be anticlimactic when we do the physical. Um, so there's different um, modes of thought out there. However, the other um, thought was, I know that was brought up, could we do a drive-through graduation on the 12th, video it, and then if we don't get to do a real graduation, um, we would uh, release the video. At this point, um, Tina and a number of her staff, as well as myself and, and Lisa Weiner, will be going to a webinar on a Wednesday and a Friday for what a virtual would look like. And there are some really incredible virtual um, graduations out there with the hopes that we're still going to do a physical, that we will double dose it for our kids so that we get what we need. Um, if not, if something happens that we don't get to do that, then at um, homecoming, do we do some kind of celebratory for our students? our seniors you know from this last year the other thing that we're looking at is our seniors and i know andrew wilson's working on this for us are giving us um, a little card with their picture um, a quote and then advice to upcoming seniors and we're going to put that on our front page of our web page and also on facebook so you can scroll and see all of those really amazing students that put in all that time and energy um, and any other ideas that you have please let us know because our whole goal is to celebrate our seniors so that they know how important they are to us. Tori, you have a couple more there, chats? Yeah, so uh, this is from Al Wehner. He says, what will teacher curriculum be when the students return in August, new or reviewed curriculum? Ah, great question. Wow, you can tell an educator's asking that question. <laughs> so that, we, we have talked with teachers right now too because we know that with the number of students that are participating, especially at the elementary, the middle, and then also in some classes at the high school too. There's a number that are participating and doing well at the high school. And then there's a few that great of classes. You can kind of see the, the different classes because Tina keeps really good track of that. Um, for students, we, our goal is to have them do continued learning through the end of the year so that they are covering ongoing learning and it's not wasted time. 11 weeks of the school year is way too much to waste a third of the school year. So. Um, but we do know that equity is a major issue as well. And so what we will do at, the, at this end of the year, we're looking at what type of, how do we look at what kids actually learn? Because it's going to be all over the board. Um, so we're looking at what would give us the best indicators. But at the beginning of the year, one thing that many teachers have asked is um, let's do some type of a diagnostic um, at the beginning of the year. So let's say that I took math one um, and in eighth grade, because we all, we all, you know, we offer that also at eighth grade. And now I didn't, I didn't participate at all. I decided that I wasn't going to do distance learning. And so I didn't turn in any assignments. I didn't check in at all. I, I just didn't continue the learning. But I got the same grade because it's hold harmless. Um, the report card would say student did not participate in fourth quarter distance learning, or student participated with minimal completion of assignments, or student completed satisfactory number of assignments in fourth quarter, or student um, completion of assignments was outstanding in fourth quarter. A teacher will see, oh, whoa, look, um, Al completed many assignments. He really is probably gonna be on target. Or, you know what, Al, something happened. Maybe both of his parents lost their job. He's really struggling. He didn't, he wasn't able to. Um, and so we need to figure out, is he gonna take math one next year? Um, or go to math two, or is it, are we going to do some type of remediation either um, at the beginning of the year with an additional section, you know, for remediation to catch up so that you can be in that. And those are all conversations that we will definitely get our teachers input in. But the one consistency is 
Yes, new learning is occurring every day here right now because we believe these 11 weeks were too sacred to waste. But the thing that will occur is to make sure that we do some type of beginning of the year assessment to see how our students did so that we're able to bridge some of those gaps. Okay, one of the things we agreed on when we set this up is that we were gonna go about 45 minutes. So Tori, I'm gonna let you pick one more question that Mary can deal with and then we'll bring this to a close. Tori, what's your pleasure? Well, there, it doesn't look like there's any in the chat. So if someone has one, they just wanna raise their hand, we can unmute them. And they can Anybody ask. else have a question? They're jumping up and down, raving their hands. I don't see anybody. Mary, thank you very much. I think as every morning I get up and I'm so thankful that I'm not a superintendent of schools <laughs> or a principal in these days. You know what, Phil, if you had the team that we have, we couldn't be more fortunate. I'm looking at, you know, some of my cabinet members who are also out there. They've been unbelievable. Our principals, our teachers, our classified staff, people who are handing out food to our students. And now we'll also be handing out food for the weekends for our students. Um, you would love being a superintendent right now. It is actually, we have the most amazing people out there. So I feel, I feel more than fortunate. So thank you to all of you. Really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Next next Tuesday, 5.30, Mr. Mark Stamer. Mark is the mountaintop district ranger. That means he's the big chief of this mountain. And so if you want to learn some things from Mark about his life and his job in this trying time, be sure and join us next Tuesday, 5.30. Let me introduce you to Mr. Mark Stamer. Thank you for being with us. I hope you enjoyed our time with Mary this afternoon. Hope you have a good rest of the week. We'll look forward to seeing you next Tuesday. Thank you very much. Thank you.